Hi, all. Leanne Doland here, putting on my novelist hat now because I want to tell you about my new book, The Marriage Sabbatical. It comes out April 2nd and is available for pre-order now. My favorite part about being a novelist is asking myself the question, what if dot, dot, dot. And for this book, The Marriage Sabbatical, I asked myself the question, what if you could take a vacation from your marriage? That's right. In this book, a couple decides to give it a shot. It's fun. It's adventurous. It's what Booklist calls a great choice for book clubs looking for a twist on contemporary fiction tropes. Well, thanks, Booklist. I appreciate that. The Marriage Sabbatical from William Morrow is available for pre-order now everywhere and comes out April 2nd. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. What's a satellite sister? The person you call when the best thing in your life happens or the worst. The person that gets you up, gets you going, and gets you through. And every once in a while, changes your mind. This podcast is part pep talk, part weekly check-in. Like grabbing coffee with a friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Satellite Sisterhood. You are listening to Satellite Sisters. I'm Leanne Dolan. I'm here in Pasadena, California. I'm a writer, a producer. And today, Liz, we're going to be talking about colon cancer because March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. And I have been diagnosed, I was diagnosed with colon cancer four and a half years ago. So I'm going to do some follow up material. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe that was four and a half years ago, Leanne. This is Liz Dolan. I'm in Santa Monica. Yeah. It, it's, it's so interesting that this much time has gone by. I'm very curious to see how your thinking has changed, how your emotions have changed. Really interested to talk about this. Right. So for some background, I was diagnosed in August of 2019, and I went through um, surgery for colon cancer. What you're going to hear today uh, are excerpts from the show that I taped about a month after my surgery. It was the first time I had spoken about the fact that I had been diagnosed or had colon cancer. Um, it was, you can hear in my voice that it's the experience is kind of new. I still have yeah. a lot of anxiety about it, trepidation. I was very grateful that I had skilled surgeons and nurses and that my colon cancer was caught early and I wasn't going to need um, follow up with radiation or chemotherapy because the doctors had gotten it all. So that was all great news. When I listen back to it now, Liz, four and a half years later, there's so many lessons I've learned, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to share those with listeners at the end of the show. And anybody who's been through cancer, any kind of cancer, or has a family member or friend who's been through cancer, so that's everybody listening now. I yes, feel right. like the lessons I've learned are going to apply to everybody. But um, the first segment, Liz, we're going to hear is all about my diagnosis and the surgery prep and just... What an overwhelming experience it is when your doctor first says to you, you have cancer, right? right? That's because all of a sudden you're kind of swallowed up by the the cancer industrial complex, right? Yeah. And I just, I, I had envisioned myself as someone that was going to get all kinds of other terrible diseases that we have in our genes, the, Alzheim the Alzheimer's, yeah. stroke, you know, other things like that. I just never really thought I was going to get cancer. So it was so overwhelming. And the one thing you learn right away is like, boy, not only am I not an expert in cancer, I don't really don't know that much about it at all. Like, and people start firing questions at you and you're ill-prepared. So it yeah. took me a long time to come to grips with sort of what was happening and to try to get emotionally on top of it. And you're definitely going to hear that in the first segment. And then the second segment uh, is me going over the surgery, the post-op care, um, some of the lingering questions, getting back out there, and what my follow-up might look like. And um, interesting for me to listen back to, you know, where I was four and a half years ago. Uh, it, I was so positive, and we had no idea that we were heading into a pandemic. Oh, my God. Heading into a Imagine. pandemic. Oh. So there was just a... I was like, oh, it's all going to come together. And I felt super positive to like March 5th and then things went south. But, um, but uh, so all that's in there. And I think um, for those of you maybe who've been recently diagnosed with colon cancer, any kind of cancer, you might find a lot of similarities in what you're feeling and thinking 
Or again, if you have family members who have just been some, through some sort of surgery for cancer, I think there are going to be some lessons in there. And then we're going to come back at the end of the show, Liz, and I am going to go through a few lessons I've learned now. I mean, Great. spoiler spoiler alert, I am still cancer free. So oh, that that's is the great that is the Nothing, most important thing. I'm not holding anything back. Four and a half years later, I've been under the care of an oncologist for that entire time. And I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. And I am cancer free. But I, I'm not quite a survivor yet because you have to get to five years. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm waiting for in six months, uh, hoping to call myself a survivor. But there's a lot going on in those four and a half years that you think about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the show. Okay, great. All right. So this is uh, the first segment you're going to hear is something we recorded in November of 2019. I was about a month out from surgery. I'm Leanne. For those of you who are new to the show, Leanne Dolan. I'm 54. I'm a female. I have a couple of kids. And in general, I have been in good health most of my life. Super health. Do I have good years and bad mm -hmm. years? Sure. <laughs> Does my weight go up and down? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, do I try to eat healthy like 80% of the time? Yeah. yeah. Do I eat ice cream? Sure, I do. <laughs> you uh, actually grow some of your own food. I grow so. my own kale, Liz. <laughs> and it's important to this story because in August, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And that was a shocker to me. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the diagnosis. We're going to talk about what I experienced physically and emotionally. We're going to talk about the surgery I went through and the recovery and the outcome. I don't want to leave people hanging because right. it does have a pretty good ending. I have a very good prognosis. So here is the short story of what happened. And then we're going to break down some of these things. In August, I had a colonoscopy. I was a reluctant participation in the colonoscopy participant. Yes. But mm -hmm. I went, I got it done, I did the prep, no problem. And then I was shocked when a week later the biopsy came back. They had removed a polyp, the gastro thought it was fine, the biopsy came back, it was cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I had a series of appointments that if you've ever been in the world of oncology, you know what those appointments are, CAT scan, surgeon, you know, pre op Is it all just terrifying? Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'll get to, like, it gets increasingly terrifying, but yeah. And the best course of action for me was surgery to remove about 10 inches of my right colon mm -hmm. and the surrounding lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. who, who knew, Liz, there were lymph nodes? <laughs> Okay. No. I Julia, didn't know there was a right and a left colon. Yeah. Leah. So, so again, we're very much. Stay with me. We're, we are not experts. We're just sisters. <laughs> we're going to get to all of that. So many surprises over the last three months. In your own body. In my own body. Uh, I had the surgery a month ago. A very skilled surgeon took out the right side of my colon, pieced me back together, hooked up the, the healthy part of my colon to the transverse colon. And then uh, I have been in recovery, but the best news is they did pathology on the part of the colon they took out in the lymph nodes, and I am cancer-free. There was no further cancer. Oh, my God. And That I, was so such crazy. good news when you got that. So I, I can't even tell you. Just the relief was overwhelming. But so there's no follow-up treatment for me. I don't need chemo, and I don't need radiation, which are all courses of action if the cancer has spread or is deeper in the colon or has metastasized to mm -hmm. other organs. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a surgical solution. So for right now, I am cancer-free. My prognosis is very good. Is it 100% I'm going to live the rest of my life great? No. Mm -hmm. So anything less than 100%, <laughs> not great, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is a worry. It's a worry. But, sure. um, yeah. but I was diagnosed with essentially stage one cancer. And so I'm going to tell you now what happens after after this, and we'll get to that later okay. on in the show. But I thought we'd just take this step by step because yeah. each p piece of it was pretty important, particularly getting that darn colonoscopy. And I just am doing this show because I want people to do that if they were like me. Mm -hmm. But first of all, I would like to give a medical disclaimer. I, I think I've proven I'm not a doctor already. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> Many, I think many we've... times, Liam. Yeah. <laughs> Over years of satellite sisters, yeah. I think we've all proven that. We would endorse no. that position. Do yeah. not take medical advice from Lee and Dolan. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's more that I, you know, I. if you have questions about your particular situation, you should talk to your doctor. Yes. Don't listen to me and go, well, Leon didn't say X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Please. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm also not a cancer expert. 
I'm not even an expert on my own cancer right. and because it's really a learning experience. And there's a good part of it where you're in denial and you're just going step by step. And I can't I have not been through the gauntlet like many other cancer patients have after years of treatment. They can quote studies and things like that. That is not me. I okay. went from point A to point B. So, so as we say here on Satellite Sisters, no follow-up questions. No. Well, I w- if you have follow-up questions, you know where you should go, Liz? The American Cancer Society website. Got and it. that, go to trusted places on the web. Uh, you know, don't go to, like, people's personal blogs or their Instagram posts. Yeah. Do not do that because that's bad news. I went there. But go to the American Cancer Society if you have questions. Also, over at our website, we're going to have some resources specifically for colon cancer and colorectal cancer. So that's important. Mm -hmm. Just if you have questions. Leanne, that is solid advice. Yes, (laughs) it's solid advice. Thank you. All right. So why I'm talking about it? Because I dragged my feet on this colonoscopy. I'm 54. Screening Uh usually happens at 50. Mm -hmm. And you know what I was freaked out by? The the anesthesia, you know, really? yeah, a oh, lot. Okay, not the prep because no. most people that it's the prep that puts them off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to prep to me always seemed like a fine weight loss opportunity. <laughs> and seriously, and living in Los Angeles where they sell colonics, like that's a treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it wasn't that; it was the anesthesia. Because about 15 years ago, I read an article in a paper about somebody who got anesthesia from a dentist and never came, woke up. And oh, that really? was all it took for me to that have an irrational fear of anesthesia. It's oh. stupid now when I say it out loud, but it was real. So I just dragged my feet on this. And then we changed health insurance and we changed doctors. So, uh, you know, the next thing I know, it's been a couple of years. I haven't gotten it. And then honestly, this is also not medically sound, but I have seven older siblings. Yes, you four, are the youngest of eight. Four sisters, three brothers. None of you had had bad colonoscopies. I thought I, I'm fine. Okay, that is very unsound. That See? is the worst. Yes. <laughs> it's that so, is so worst unsound. Yes. Rational yep. thinking I've ever heard. Yep. Because right. we do have colon cancer in the family. Our beloved Aunt Virginia yes. died yes. of colon cancer. Yes. Now, again, this is where I'm not a geneticist. Mm-hmm. So, like, my okay. gastro said that's actually not a direct genetic thing. So oh, I don't. Really? Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to be. I, I don't, okay. Again, I apologize yes. for the misinformation right. already. That and is we're actually, only eight minutes in. Yep. That's just not really how that works, Liz. But that's okay. okay. So, uh, so long story short, I was just dragging my feet, and I was at a college weekend like two years ago with my girlfriends, like six of them. And as women tend to do at the end of the night, we're all just sitting around complaining about medical issues and hormones and menopause and why are our knees going and our shoulders going yeah. and what's happening to our faces and things like that. And I confessed that I hadn't had a colonoscopy. And my friend Kara looked at me and she's like, what is wrong with you? Get your act together. And I was Mm. like, oh, wow, she's right. That's kind of my brand. Like, has her act together, you know? (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, other people are kind or thoughtful. I'm just like the person who has their act together. Like (laughs) That is true. Most other aspects of my life, I got it together. You know, schedules are happening. Projects are moving forward. I'm working. You're a producer, Lan. I'm I'm a producer. I'm calendarizing. I'm scheduling. But I was falling down on the job on this. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, I know, she's right. I have to get my act together. So that meant I had to get a primary. I had to get some blood tests, this and that. And for a year, like every couple of months, Kara would text me with usually a string of poop emojis and just say, have you booked your appointment yet? And finally, I was like, just to shut her up, I'm like, "Okay, I'm just going to get that stupid colonoscopy because I'm never going to hear the end of this. Yes. And even two weeks before the colonoscopy, I was at an event and we were my husband and I were at lunch with a gastroenterologist. I'm not going to answer a lot of questions because this guy was clearly a crackpot. And he spent the whole lunch trying to talk me out of getting the colonoscopy. Really? That it was a waste of time and money and blah, blah, blah. I, oh, I remember you told me that story. Yeah. Lately. And yeah, I yeah. almost... You were thinking of canceling yeah. your appointment. Yeah. yeah. I almost canceled because I was like, that is exactly the sort of advice I needed to switch it off. Yeah. But then I remembered, oh, I'm seeing Karen two weeks at our girls weekend and she will yell at me if I don't get that stupid colonoscopy. See, this is the power of the satellite sisterhood. And this is why I'm doing the show today because... This is where I'm going to get choked up. Mm-hmm. And then I'll try to hold it together. Crying but... is also part of your brand, Liam. So don't worry. We know, <laughs> we know that about you. Because um, when the gastro told me, he said, if you had waited another six months to a year, it would have been a very bad diagnosis. Oh, wow. Very bad. Di- and that, I mean, that was the only time during the process where 
I just really broke down in the doctor's office. And I just thought I 100 percent could have waited six months to a year. I couldn't talk myself out of it. That guy almost did. I could have just put it off or said, oh, I'll do it in the new year. Oh, I have to lose five more pounds. I don't mm-hmm. want to get on the scale before I go to the gastro. Mm-hmm. You know, all the stupid things that we think that of, we say oh, to each other. I can't get someone to drive me home because it's actually kind of hard to find someone to take the day off to drive you home. Like, right. yeah, I totally, totally could have done it. And when he, when the gastro, when we were finally in his office and he was explaining, he said, no, this would not have been good. Wow. So, okay, Kara. So, yeah, <laughs> big shout out to Kara. <laughs> big and, shout out. You know. Doing the job. Right. So that was the huge relief. But, um, so I got the colonoscopy and it was fine. I, I had no problem. I, I enjoyed the prep, frankly. It wasn't a big deal. You're not sick. You're just you're just going to the it's bathroom. Just a cleanse. Yeah, it's a cleanse. So and I left and I felt great. Like at no point before or after the colonoscopy did I feel bad. I felt great. You didn't I, have any symptoms. Yeah. No, I I was symptom free. And this is where I want to just go. I was symptom free. And uh I want to explain what the symptoms are. This is the only medical advice I'm going to give. But okay. you can look these up at colon cancer sites. Blood in your stool or bleeding from the rectum. Unexplained or unintentional weight loss. That's never happened to me in my life. <laughs> okay. Anemia. Unexplained fatigue. Cramping pain in the lower stomach. A feeling of discomfort or an urge for after a bowel movement when you don't have to have one. A change in your bowel habits. A change in appearance of the stool. Okay, mm-hmm. those are the actual signs that should you should call right now. Stop the podcast. Call right now if you're mm-hmm. feeling those. But I didn't have any of that stuff. I, I just I didn't have any of that stuff. I felt great. They removed a polyp. It was a pretty big polyp. But the gastro, who's been doing it for twenty years, said, "No, it looks benign to me. Just call the office in a week, and you'll get the biopsy." Okay. So, oh, yeah. So, and I was like, "It's done." Mm-hmm. I had to go to a wedding the next day. I thought I lost a few pounds. It looked good. It looked good. <laughs> Look good in my dress. It was all good. And uh, I was going to call Friday afternoon. I thought, oh, so I'll just wait for Monday. They probably don't have it by now. So I waited till Monday. And when I called Monday afternoon, that's when the nurse said, oh, I'm going to have to have the doctor call you about that. Oh, that's a red flag. It's a really not a thing you want them mm-hmm. to say when you mm-hmm. call for the results of any test. So I, I called my husband. I'm like, I just got something. This was weird. And he's like, okay, well, he was at a work thing. He was going to be out all night. He's like, okay, well, I'm sure it'll be fine, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And it could have been just something precancerous, a red flag, something. So if I, they then the nurse did say, but your own doctor is not here. He had to go away in a medical emergency. So the doctor covering him is going to call you. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, because at that point you just want to know. Yeah. So you think in your mind, oh, it doesn't matter. So six hours later, the doctor on call called me and that was a terrible phone call. He had no information other than I had colon cancer. So he just kept saying, well, this is terrible. I feel awful. This is really bad. I'm sorry I have to tell you this. The polyp was cancerous. Oh, this is terrible. Are you sitting down? It was so vague and so awful. I thought I was dying. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It was a terrible, terrible phone call. And so without any actual information, I just went to the worst possible place. Of course, everyone and, would. Yeah. And uh, he said, I, I can see you in my office in a couple of days. And and because you have to get, and he's like, you have to go find an oncologist and a surgeon. I was like, what? Mm. Like, you just, what? I don't know how to find a surgeon. I, I don't <laughs> I know. Right. What? So yeah, you get plunged into this yeah. world. And yeah. you're not familiar at all. No. And, with how it, to right. do any of it. and not emotionally prepared at all. So, you know, the next morning, it was like 5 a.m., Julie. I think I called you. I didn't sleep all night. I called you, and I was like, I'm dying. Like, I have colon cancers. That's the only information I had was I have colon cancer. Nothing else. And then, yeah, and— and then we cried. And then, Liz, you yeah. happened to call me mm-hmm. at like 7 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, OK, I got to go, Jill. I got to tell Liz. And then we cried. Right, like, right. I mean, I, I just saw the worst case scenario. And then about an hour after I talked to you guys, my gastro called. He was taking care of his mom in Wisconsin. He oh. had to go. And he's, he was mad. The other guy called me. He said, no, 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 no. This is why you have the colonoscopy. We found something. 90% chance I got it out during the colonoscopy. I removed that polyp. 90% chance you are cancer-free now. But there's a 10% margin that you're not, and you're young, and you're healthy, 
So we should treat this as aggressively as possible so it does not come back. Mm -hmm. He said, here's what I would do if it were my colon, which is exactly what you want your doctor to say. Yes. And and the solution was, they kept saying a surgical solution, was to remove the area of the colon where the, where the polyp had been. They actually tattooed the inside of my colon during the colonoscopy so they knew exactly where the, oh, really? the polyp wow. had been. That's yes. handy. Yeah, it's yeah. handy. Yeah. tattoo now. Yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> well, now it's gone because they cut it out, Julie. They hacked it out. But, uh, yeah, so, and... And he said, I won't be back for 10 days, but meet in my office. I'll run through everything with you. I'll give you all the information. And that was like the weirdest time because I had not enough information. Right. I could, didn't want to tell anybody. I hadn't really understood the diagnosis. I was just gathering information on the surgeons. So I told you guys. And then the only other person I called was my friend Stephanie, who yeah. had been through exactly the same diagnosis nine mm -hmm. months before. Wow, she good. was incredibly helpful. I could not yeah. have gone through the whole experience without that. But once I gathered the information, I sat in the gastro's office with my husband. He went over it again. This is what you should do. You're young. You're healthy. Let's do this. It's a standard, you know, standard surgery. They know how to do this. We have excellent surgeons here. These are the surgeons I would recommend. And then I picked my surgeon. And we went into the meeting, and he explained what he was going to do. And that's, Liz, when I learned things like, um, the colon is the same as your large intestine. <laughs> Who knew? I think Did you really know that? I Come knew on. It, I knew it in the fifth grade, yeah. maybe. <laughs> I yeah. think that's fifth grade health class. Yeah. And I not mean, really that... it's not your small intestine. It's no. yeah. And then it all leads into your bowels. And that's sort of all one system. And, you know, it's there's 26 feet of it. So if they take out a foot or something, it's not you a can giant spare it. deal. You can spare it. <laughs> yeah. So part well, of it is amazing they can do that surgery. It's amazing. You know? And it's amazing that our health care, that we have people that are talented and knowledgeable enough to do that kind of surgery. Yeah. You know. And yeah, I'd be grateful for that because in other parts of the world, A, you wouldn't have had the colonoscopy and B, they probably couldn't have performed the surgery. Yeah. yeah. Other parts of America, the same yeah. thing yeah. is true. Yeah. So, even the screenings, the fact that, you know, you're urged to get the screen. Right. You're insured for the screening. Right. All of those things are really, would you do that if you didn't have insurance that covered that? No, no, you probably wouldn't. wouldn't. It's, I've no. thought a lot about access since mm -hmm. the whole thing, access to all kinds of things. So but prior to meeting with the surgeon, though, I had spoken to our brother, Jim, who is not a doctor, but mm. plays one in our family. Right. <laughs> Because he is in the medical field. Mm -hmm. And he, I had told him I was going to ask, Leon, it's, it's no brainer. It's a procedure, Leon. You're just going to be in and out. It's no big deal. They do them every day. Yeah. And so then I'm sitting in the surgeon's office and he's explaining, like, taking out the foot, the lymph nodes, three hours, the anesthesia. I was like, you know, this sounds like more than a, a procedure, a quick in and out. <laughs> feel like a procedure is like removing skin flaps, not like <laughs> a giant chunk of my colon. But, you know, that's essentially what it was. The doctor performed this laparoscopically. So it's a robotic arm. They make six incisions and then essentially what's like a, you know, a, a bigger incision, like a C-section incision to get the colon out. And this guy does a lot of them. This is his specialty. So I felt like I was in really good shape. That's great. I felt like I was in good shape. I had the information. I was ready to go. And then, like, the fact that it was cancer started to bleed into my head. Like, mm. I had all the information now lined up. I had a plan. You know, they were very enthusiastic at the surgeon's office. Like, you cannot go home and sit on your couch. You need to get in shape for this surgery. It's five weeks away. You need to do this. You need to keep exercising. You need to eat right. You need to step up your cardio. You know, this Interesting. is... Interesting. They said, this is your Super Bowl. Or as my friend Liz said, isn't it your Super Bowl? Really, Lillian? <laughs> Wouldn't it be your Super Bowl? So it's good that you have friends that can make you laugh even yes, in the crisis. Yes. That's important. Yes. So that like distracted me to the point where I was like, OK, I'm just going to go in. I've had this bad colonoscopy and now I'm just going to get it out. Yeah. And then I had to go for the CAT scan. And that's when it all got very real to me. They had said, oh, you, you know, you can drive yourself. But I thought, oh, I'll have Sheila take me. And the morning of the CAT scan, I was a mess. That's our, that's our other middle sister, Sheila. Yes. Right. So uh, the CAT scan is when you have to drink the special liquid and they, and, you know, they take pictures. And in my mind, like, my whole body was going to light up with cancer. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I feared, right? Mm -hmm. And I went in. And I drank my mixture and I did it. And I was there. And as soon as the nurse, the scan nurse said to me, so when were you diagnosed with colon cancer? I was like, what? Is that what I have? Because in my mind, I had been thinking, 
I had a bad colonoscopy. Yeah. yeah. So now I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I guess I have colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go for all the pre-op uh, appointments where they do the blood draws and the EKG. And then they spend like two or three hours. It was a long appointment taking you through. Here's everything you need to do before. Here's everything you need to stop. Here's what's going to happen in the hospital. He, you know. And if you think the colonoscopy prep is bad, <laughs> where do you have to have your colon jacked up? Is that prep is really bad. So I got like, they're handing me all these, here's this and here's that. And oh, yeah. And you have to take a pregnancy test the morning of the operation. Oh, right. And I just, everything started to get very real. I just, I did not really understand what was happening until that moment. And mm -hmm. that's when I had to kind of get out of some of the obligations I had. Like, I just thought, well, I'm just going to cruise along and I'm just going to exercise and I'm going to do this and I'm, I'll do this and check, check, check. And mm -hmm. then I'll go in for my surgery. On Your the procedure. 16th. Yeah, yes. my procedure. And no big deal. And uh, that was not true. I found like things were starting to fall apart mentally for me. I found it very difficult to tell people about it. I didn't really want to interact with people. And they gave, assigned me a nurse navigator who was a really critical part of the care team. She coordinated the care between the gastro and the surgeon and the hospital and if I needed an oncologist at any point. And I was trying to explain to her, like, I'm supposed to go speak at this conference in Atlanta and I'm supposed to be right now in Santa Fe speaking at a conference and I have to host this cancer support community fundraiser. So that was great. And she said, is it going to add stress to your life? Mm -hmm. because if it is, you shouldn't do it. Right now, what you need to do is eliminate all the stress and just focus on what you have, the task at hand. That was just to excellent be, advice. Uh -huh. it, it was a life changer because mm -hmm. I was, I could see things were falling apart. I didn't, I wasn't focused on, you know, work. I wasn't responding to emails. I was so freaked out. And I just thought, oh, I'll just go and do all these things and then no one will have to know. And then I'll just like tuck away and get this procedure. And that was not the case. That's when things got very real for me. And those were the hardest emails I had to write. Like, I have to get out of She Podcast. So I'm sorry, Atlanta. That's why I couldn't come. I had to get out of this other conference. I had to bail on big things and small things and social engagements and things mm -hmm. like that. Just cleared the calendar. And I was so glad that I did because yeah. the last couple of weeks before surgery, I was worthless. I mean, I, <laughs> I was... Yeah. You know, not, I was not, I was not, I did not have my act together. I did not have my act together. I, I really and, and struggled. Just like anyone else. Yeah. Your, your, your brain, it's just swimming in your head. Right. right? Like all of the possible outcomes. Right. Yeah. Right. So even though the doctor said 90% chance we got it all, that 10%, I would say I was spending 10% of my time thinking about the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you know, what if there is cancer, a lot more cancer? What if it has metastasized? What if it's in my lymph nodes? Like, all those things you I also didn't want to be so Pollyanna, so super positive that if that happened, then I was going to fall apart after the surgery. I yeah. wanted to be realistic, mm -hmm. but I could not focus on anything else. I was it was a miracle I made it through some of those shows. Mm -hmm. And even the show the day before the surgery, I thought initially, oh, I'll be able to do that. I'll just be yeah. fine. And like I, by the first of October, I was like, yeah, you're on your own. Yeah. I cannot. Know what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. Regular you know? listeners right. know we brought Sheila and in. And that was the right decision. Yes, yeah. It was definitely the right, right. decision. Right. And, 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 and what I found was that the conversations I had with my friends who had been through cancer were absolutely the most meaningful. Mm -hmm. And you know who you are. Thank you so much, Liz and Susan and Jill. And I just, they, they all, and Stephanie and Lily, they all said like exactly what I needed to hear. Just fantastic advice that really, you know, made it possible for me to get to that surgery date. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to let's take a quick break here. Sure. We want to thank our sponsors. We love them. Then we'll come back and we'll hear about the surgery and the post op and what's changed in your life. We got now we've got like the good news part yeah. of it, right? Right. Okay, we will be right back. We're the Satellite Sisters. Liz, it's the time of the show when I talk about my hair. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> It's one of my favorite times <laughs> because you have very good hair, Leanne. I would say of all the sisters, you are at near the top. You and Monica both have excellent, full, thick hair. The rest of us were all along a spectrum. Okay. 
Well, I would like to thank pros for my hair, uh -huh. uh, you know, because I have really been sticking with this pros regimen for a couple of years now, and I keep adding pieces to it to really enrich my whole pros experience. I can't tell you, I get a lot of compliments on my hair. I'm very happy with my hair. I don't have too many bad hair days. Uh, and I feel like it's healthy hair, which is really yes. great. I, I'm not overworking it or overusing the products. They all work together, Liz. That's because at Pros, you get you take that personal quiz. You know, yeah. yes. they're going to analyze 85 factors, and so they handpick clean, sustainably sourced ingredients that get me closer to my hair goals with every wash, Liz. Hair goals. I feel I like take... they understand your hair. By the I... time you get to the bottom of that list. 85 things, they know your hair. That's right. So I'm taking the hair vitamins. I take the hair vitamins. It's made a huge difference. The pros sends me every month. Great. I'll just take the vitamins, the shampoo, the conditioner. Sometimes they need the leave-in conditioner. Sometimes they need the pre-shampoo treatment. I use it all. It makes a huge difference. So pros, thank you so much. They are the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral too. If that's important to you, Fantastic. Yeah, Pros right. is a certified B Corp and an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. We love Pros and we'd like you to try it. Get your own custom made to order hair care from Pros. Take your free in depth hair consultation and get 50% off your first subscription order, plus 15% off and free shipping every subscription order after that. Okay, 50% off the wow. first subscription order plus 15% off and free shipping on every subscription order after that. Here's where you go. Go to pros.com slash sisters. And pros is P-R-O-S-E. Pros.com slash sisters for your free in-depth hair consultation and 50% off your first subscription order. Thanks, pros. Leon and Julie here from Satellite Sisters. And we want to thank our friend, Jenny Kane. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> we love Jenny Kane. We know you know it's a California brand through and through, and we love their staples because it makes getting dressed so easy. Minimalist, effortless, but totally refined. And hello, Julie Dolan, that's kind of you. Minimalist, effortless, and totally refined. What have you been wearing from Jenny Kane this week? Leon, I love the cocoon cardigan. It's perfect for the Hot again, cold again, weather we're having, you know, this is sweater weather. And you can just pop on that cardigan. And even if you're wearing something schlumpy underneath, all of a sudden you look elevated and you're ready to go. <laughs> you look minimalist, ever listen to totally refined when you wear the cocoon cardigan? Yes, I do, Leanne. Uh, I get compliments on it, too, because it's just the perfect thing to put on. Well, that's why we love Jenny Kane, is that everything is beautifully designed and really flatters the wearer. So we want to encourage you to check out everything over at JennyKane.com. You're going to find your new uniform. What is it that you want to put on that just perks up your, your presentation? Find your new uniform at JennyKane.com. Our listeners get 15% off their first order when they use code SISTERS at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at JennyKane.com. And Jenny Kane is spelled J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E. JennyKane.com, promo code SISTERS. Let getting dressed be one less thing to worry about. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, we're back. So, Liam, the day of the surgery, right? what was that like? You know, one of the things I was most worried about was that I was going to be freaked out, that mm -hmm. I was really going to have a lot of anxiety. I've never had surgery before. Not a fan of blood. Even the blood, <laughs> blood draw. You know, mm -hmm. I just, there were so many parts of it I was very anxious about. I was also anxious that I would not survive the surgery because, again, oh. stuff happens. Right. And, you know, I know it's right. irrational and the guy's done eight zillion of these and He's a top man, but uh, mm -hmm. I just really felt like, what if I don't survive? So what I had started, what I did in the in the run up to the surgery was I started meditating. I mean, seriously, Liz, I thought I better just find some way to calm myself down when I am in that pre-op. I had to get up at three thirty in the morning, do a couple of terrible things mm -hmm. as the 
final <laughs> part of the of the prep. So we are not going into details. Not going on that. into that. Skip over those, Liam. <laughs> they are unspeakable. What I had to just do. ask your doctor about that, <laughs> and then be at the be at the Huntington Hospital at five thirty in the morning. And uh, so I hadn't gotten much sleep, and I thought and the surgery was at seven thirty. I thought those two hours may be the most difficult for me. Uh-huh. So I actually just downloaded an app and started meditating prior to the surgery so I would have like some way to breathe and get through the two hours. That is smart. And uh, my husband brought me, uh, he's a solid citizen, you know, emotional support companion. (laughs) Not huge. I mean, he was so good on everything else. Was the garage clean? Yes. Yes. (laughs) Was the dog walked? Yes. Uh Did we have our will and trust and medical directive all ship shape before I went into the hospital? Yes. Yes. You know, did he drive quickly to the hospital and drop me off off at valet, even though he hates to valet park? Yes, he did. But he was sitting in the corner reading Mm -hmm. the paper. I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to meditate. And I'm glad I did that. And then everybody comes in. It's it's a very, if you've ever been in surgery, you know. And the thing is busy. It's super busy. And people are poking and prodding and everyone's talking to you and they seem psyched and ready to go. And what struck me when I was on the gurney going in was um, I was breathing. I was not anxious. And I thought, wait, this is like a movie. Like when you're looking up and you're seeing that shot that's so familiar of people on patients. And two, there was just so much expertise in that room. Like when I went into the surgical room, I'd never been into a surgery room like that. I mean, the robotic arm is a million dollar piece of equipment that they're using. The doctors, the residents, the anesthesiologists, the excellent nurse team. They had so much exp- I was humbled by the experience. And then then I was out, Liz. Then I don't remember anything. See, and the anesthesia is really good. working and, for you now. I know. And they said, ironically, afterwards, they said, you take anesthesia very well. So <laughs> sign me up now. I'm on the anesthesia plan. <laughs> So so then I woke up in the hospital and uh, in my hospital room and my son Brooks was there. And I all I, first thing I said was, I made it. I made it through. Oh. And I did. I was just so yeah. grateful to have made it through the yeah. surgery. Like that was a tremendous worry to me. Yeah. And it would be hard to understate that. So well, and Julie, you and I know, I mean, we're, Leanne, we're asking you questions yeah. as if we didn't know when all this was yeah. happening. Obviously, some of this we already know. But I know for me anyway, when you came out of surgery and we got a text from your son Brooks that you right. were that was awesome. That you yeah. were good. That was just that was very emotional. It was yeah. It was it's a big relief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were all worried. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. To hear course. that to hear yeah. that from your son was just very yeah. sweet. He is very good in the hospital. <laughs> he, I would get I would give Brooks uh, sign him up for any post op team. <laughs> yeah. He, he was he's he's super very solid. Good. He was super solid. So, um, so I only spent thirty hours in the hospital. You know, I again, star patient. I uh, my I I recovered really well. I was able to get up and walk around. They try to get all systems going when you're in the hospital. Believe me, that is a big worry because they've just taken out a large part of your digestive yep. and your uh-huh. bowel, your bowels, frankly. That's what they are. Yes. And uh, so that's always a worry in any hospital stay. But imagine if they've hacked up your bowels. Yeah. Like, that's a big <laughs> worry. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so again, we're not going to go into the details of no. how they get all the system yeah. started again, but yeah, I was, that's important. I, I can was understand. hooked up to an IV and then they took me off of that within about 12 hours. And I was on some pretty normal pain medication, just Tylenol during the day and some opioids at night. And after about 30 hours, they had done some blood workups. They said, you're free to go. They, the resident made it clear, like, we want you out of here. He said, you're not sick. And if you stay here, you could get sick. They want you out because of the infection. That's so, so interesting. I was a little scared because I thought I'd be going home a day later. And I hadn't set up any help. Julie, you were coming in on Saturday, but I was leaving right. Thursday. Uh-huh. So, right. again, my I know. I was. I, I thought, oh, Lance being an overachiever. <laughs> I know. Leaving the hospital early. Yeah. I, I wasn't trying. Like, I kind of wanted to yeah. stay, but they were so adamant that I leave. I was like, well, they're the doctors. So I mm-hmm. should just, so far, I've done pretty well doing what the doctors have told me. So I went home. And then later that day on Friday, I got the call that the biopsy, the pathology was clear for the rest of the colon. And that was the other huge piece of it. Huge. A giant relief. Call came late Friday afternoon. My son Brooks was there. I just, that was, I was just so grateful and relieved. And tears. uh, Yeah. A lot lot of tears. 
Yeah. A lot of tears because that was, I, I tell you, I, this is probably a whole nother show, but I have so much um, admiration for people who, who outlaw, who these are long treatments for people, you know, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. yeah. You mean if they have to have chemo and radiation yeah. and yeah, what it takes to yeah. get through that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I made an appointment with cancer. That was the colonoscopy. But other people battle. They're warriors. They're in there. It's years of treatment. They have to do this surgery and recover from that. And then they know they're going into months and months of chemo or radiation. Yeah. And so when they said, I won't need any further treatment, I was just so relieved. Mm -hmm. And again, humbled by the people that do this time and time again. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it just fills up your whole mind space. You can't think of anything else. Of course. It becomes your whole world. So I was hugely relieved. And I think I was riding kind of a wave of adrenaline when Julie showed up. And uh -huh. then I just... <laughs> And then I just when Mary Poppins shows up at your door, <laughs> just hand it all over. I came. I had my bag. I had my, my turkey meatloaf recipe. I was ready to go. Yes, you look. You look surprisingly good, Leanne, when I arrived. Okay, you were first of all. You were sitting up, right, okay? you were in your garden, and uh, and just as you said, I mean, I don't think you had a big reaction to the anesthesia. A lot of people, when they're given anesthesia, it takes them, you know you know, a long time to kind of be clear, but uh, you were pretty clear headed. So uh, I, I was starting from a good position and I think it speaks to all the pre-op prep that you did uh, that just made the uh, second part easier. But yes, I was on deck. I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, Liz, I do a sort of, I let the patient lead lead the uh, recovery. So whatever it's a Leanne wanted. Patient-centered <laughs> operation that yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I roll. Uh -huh. you know, whatever Leanne wanted, however she wanted it, whatever she wanted to do, I felt like she was making the right decisions for herself. And so my job yeah. was just to be quiet, keep doing the dishes, and whenever she needed something, I could give that to her. So. Yeah, I'll just say like earlier in the year, another member of our family like had a a medical procedure, and you also provided the <laughs> the post stop. So you were a you were you had just run through your whole process earlier in the year. So that's why we knew we could just go to Julie. Right. Julie, yeah. Julie's got a process. Yeah. It's sort of a subspecialty I'm developing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you have any more surgery plans, <laughs> brothers and sisters, you better get on my schedule early. That's all I can say. So uh, you know, leaving the the instructions were um, first of all again. What your colon has to do is heal. It's a big part of your digestive tract, right? So you know you you have to eat and you have to, but you have to eat very gently and softly and in a low fiber way. Uh -huh. You want your colon to rest. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the key is to not fire it up with a bunch of you know insoluble fiber. So <laughs> so There's no big burrito. Right. No 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 big anything. So but and you, to be honest, it's kind of terrifying because you think, well, I'm just going to eat one turkey meatball and my col colon's going to explode. Oh. So there's a very Julie and I thought I, I, I thought it was going to kill Lee. I know a couple of times with my the applesauce. I was like so worried. It's like I wonder if the cinnamon is going to do her in. You know, it is. It's. I mean, it was. It's. T it's. Very tender and touch and go there in the beginning. Right. And it, it it's a real thing because if you if you eat the wrong thing or too much of it or too fast, then you could have to go back in uh, at, to clear the blockage oh, in your Oh, you colon. don't want that. No. no. And again, I don't know how they do that. I assume it's like a plumber with a snake. I don't I don't know if that's true. Um, yeah. But so I was on one of, you know, bananas, rice, you know, buttered noodles. When I could eat the turkey meatball, that was like a giant step up. Uh, only herbal tea, no caffeine, obviously no wine, nothing like that. Uh, so it's a pretty specialized diet for six weeks. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm about a month into it now, and I'm able to eat now cooked vegetables, like cooked spinach, stewed tomatoes. I'm bringing them back like it's 1972. <laughs> and that, I have rediscovered my love of stewed tomatoes. Uh -huh. But anything that you think of as good for you or healthy, I cannot eat a lot of that. I can't eat raw vegetables, salads, raw fruit, nuts, seeds, whole wheat, anything like that is just too much for my colon to handle right now. And for how long will that go on? Are there certain things that you'll never be able to eat again? 
You know, Liz, I met with the, a nutritionist last week, an oncology nutritionist at the Huntington. I'm I just a big believer in using all the people at the cancer center. And <laughs> yes. um, yeah, there it's possible that there's some things I never get used to again. Uh-huh. Uh, nuts and seeds are like really h- tough. Uh-huh. So that one may be... I, I, I'm terrified to try it. Like that could be six months before I try that. Yeah. My friend Stephanie, who went through this, said it was six months before she ate a salad. Oh. You know, so... You really just have to go gingerly. I can only introduce like one or two things a week, which is not a huge volume of stuff. So um, things... You were having a cracker here. But you have always loved food. You've loved to cook food, a wide variety of food. So this is this has been a big change for you, Leah. It's a change for me. It's but you know the good news and bad news is that the diet I was eating was a pretty good pre. It's like the diet I'm supposed to get to. You know. Plant-based. I do a lot of my own cooking. I don't eat a lot of processed food. Uh, I use organic vegetables. I use organic meat, organic dairy products. So it's all good if I can get to it. But it's going to take me six months at least to get to it. Mm-hmm. Like a friend said, "Can I bring you some enchiladas?" The other day, I was like, "That would kill me." That <laughs> do not. I think that would kill me. I mean, I don't think it literally would kill me. But I was like, "No, don't bring me spicy enchiladas." What are you kidding? People just want to know what they I can know. do. You know, that's I know. so hard. I know. I, know. I mean, but I'm but, re- I mean, the caregiver or your husband would have loved the uh, uh, yes. <laughs> you got yeah. some nice things. People did. It, 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 I had a lot of great support. So, but essentially, it's a clear my activity. I can't do any abdominal work. I am walking. My doctor got me up right away, walking, uh-huh. and then sitting up. He didn't want me in bed unless I was sleeping. Julie was there. Like after every time I ate, I'd have to walk around the house to have it work through Uh the system. Mm -hmm. And when I say work through the system, I mean, you can freaking see it working through the system. Really? It's like a snake who eats a mouse. Like you eat a banana. You eat a banana. It's just that's what I mean. It's terrifying. And then I know that my surgical wounds will become tiny scars. But Julie, they were stab wounds, were they not? Yeah, they were. You had six stab wounds yeah. in your belly. Yeah. 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 It looked like I had been attacked and I was swollen. I mean, it's you're bloated, you're swollen. Uh-huh. Like there's a banana going through your colon. I mean, it's it's pretty terrifying. You feel very vulnerable and 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 then I was just exhausted. I was yes. exhausted while Julie was there and gradually I've gotten more energy and yeah, I can laugh now without it hurting. I I moved from walking around the house to walking outside. Julie Mm -hmm. can attest. I was just wandering around the backyard trying to get, you know, miles. She looked looked like kind of a crazy woman, but it was working. (laughs) But that way, she didn't want to be out on the street. She wasn't ready for that yet, Liz. You know, she wasn't ready to like bump into neighbors and or dogs. I mean, she needed to really be quiet and rest. And you were a very good patient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I would occasionally, I had directed some people to be head of communications to various groups of people. Yes. Like Sheila was taking care of my friends out of town. Uh, my friend Louise was taking care of my college friends. Julie, you were on the family. My friend mm-hmm. Sally was in charge of local people. I would send like one text and then they would disseminate. And I just sent people like, do not call me. I, d- I couldn't talk on the phone. I just, I wasn't making a whole lot of sense. I wasn't on the painkillers all the time, just a couple of nights at night, but I just, I just really Well, you just need to, to conserve your energy. Yeah. It, it's ex- for healing. Right. It's, a, it was exhausting. I did laugh every time I looked at my discharge um, instructions because it said like, limit your activities. And one was no contact sports. <laughs> every time. Yeah. Some people like, have to be told that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess yeah. they can't take anything for granted. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, what's ahead? I just had a, a very good um, appointment last week with my surgeon, and he said, I look great. I'm recovering really well, um, uh, and that um, I'll end up seeing the surgeon every three months for about a year, uh-huh. which kind of surprised me. Um, and then he said, now what we're going to do is actually recommend you to a medical oncologist. Prior to the surgery, I had not seen an oncologist. I'd seen the gastroenterologist and the surgeon. But because I didn't look like I was going to need any follow-up care, like that's what they thought, they they don't send you to an oncologist unless they need to. But he said, you know, 25 years ago, 
We probably wouldn't have sent you to an oncologist with a stage one cancer. You know, you, it would be oh, early detection. You'd be on your own. But then you have no one really minding the store in terms of watching for cancer. Not your primary, not your gastro. You stop seeing the surgeon. And he said, and it can recur. You know, it's a uh -huh. tiny percentage for me based on my stage and my age and, you know, my general overall health. But it's not an impossibility. So I... So I said, yeah, sign me up for the medical oncologist. So I'll meet with her and a couple of they're arranging the appointment now. And that also gives me the opportunity to ask about genetic testing and what I should tell Brooks and Colin, because that is a direct genetic link. Oh, I am their mother okay. and I gave birth to them. So that's a direct link. And they might have to start getting and probably will start getting colonoscopies much, much earlier than, mm -hmm. you know, recommended. Okay. So I would also like to know, to know the results yeah. of your genetic testing. I will tell, I will ask about you people, but. we are directly related. <laughs> yes. I, I know you did not give birth to me. Yes, but, but that's, <laughs> we are. But I, I just Thanks want. for clarifying that. <laughs> I, just, uh, I don't want to be confusing for new listeners. Again, I just, I just want to be clear though. The gastro said, if your aunt got it and your mother didn't get it and she lived to be 85, then there's probably no genetic link. You know, okay. people can right. get it. Just get it. Like, I mean, sure. that's, you know, he said it's probably just coincidence. You both had bad luck. Like, whatever it was, you know, it's not necessarily a genetic component. Okay. But I will ask on your behalf. Sure. Thank you. Just want <laughs> just say my siblings would like to know what this does to their okay. chances. Okay. Uh, so. Um, but can I just say? Yeah. I don't want to interrupt your flow here, but like. The moment we got all of this news from you and we were talking about it, I realized, oh, you know, it's been about 10 years since I've had my last colonoscopy. So I'm 62. I'm eight years older than you are. So I immediately went. So I have an appointment for two weeks. I'm getting I, I emailed my doctor. I'm like, I must be about due. Right. And she said, exactly. I was going to remind you next month. So I made the appointment. Leanne. In your honor, Good. the appointment is made. Good. Again, Good. I just keep going back to that. I, I, I just could have not right. done that. Right. And it just could have gotten much worse. There's no other right. way to say it. So, you know, medically, I'm going to be in the hands of this oncologist and I'm going to stay on top of things. I have to get another colonoscopy in a, in a year, in August, next August. Um, whether I'll need CAT scans and blood tests, that will be something that the oncologist decides. Uh, but I like to know that someone's looking over that. You know, physically, um, what do I have to do? I have to, you know be in shape and exercise for the rest of my life, e, right? Damn it. Why is that always <laughs> the answer? I, I mean, it's nothing we all don't know, but the list of things I have to do, I'm like, yeah, I knew I was supposed to do that already. Be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. Well, <laughs> no chance of that. Uh, physically active for 30 minutes. Avoid sugary drinks. Um, eat a variety of vegetables, fruits. Limit consumption of red meats. Mm -hmm. So I would like to call BS on the pork industry. Really? Why? I did not know the pork industry. Pork was a red meat. Well, no. Right. It's I the, almost served you a pork tenderloin. Yeah. Right, yeah. And we, isn't it the, it's marketed we, as the other white meat. So that's just a big old lie. It's a lie. It's a red meat. So, because I was thinking, oh, the pork tenderloin. Yeah, that's nice and tender. That would taste good. And then I like looked it up. I'm like, that pork is a red meat. We've, we've been okay. hoodwinked. So... <laughs> Uh, avoid processed meats. And, you know, you think you don't eat any, but sure, I, I get deli turkey all the time. Oh, That's yeah. gone. Uh, so how about prosciutto ham? Oh, wow. Gone. It doesn't matter how high end, how expensive it is. <laughs> Honey baked ham? Gone. You know, really? like just she said. You, well, you've had quite you've had quite a bit of honey. Baked I know, ham. I know. You've had a lifetime of honey baked ham, Leon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to limit my alcoholic drinks to one a day for women. I mean, I haven't had any in a while. Sure. And then the, the the nutritionist did say, don't drink all seven on one day. So that's just good <laughs> advice. That's always good advice. <laughs> How about coffee? Can you go uh, back to coffee? Yeah, I'm back at half calf. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, caffeine is the stimulant. So you have to be careful there. You know, you want a little, a little is good. A lot is not. So one and a half cups of half-calf coffee a day. And I'm totally fine with that. And I, you saw me. I came in today with a, a decaffeinated latte. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to drink this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a waste. Forget it. That's a waste of money and whatever. <laughs> I'm just drinking a lot of herbal tea, a lot of that. And uh, and limit consumption of salty foods and processed foods. 
Okay. So it's all the things we know, but I really have to do it now because it's my colon. You mm. know, it's so nothing's going to kill me if I have an ice cream sundae, but it's yeah. not a great idea to have an ice cream sundae, you know, and that would even now would be six weeks. Uh huh. And then, you know, mentally, I just want to figure out how not to think about it all the time, you know, and that's yeah. harder. That, that will be harder, you know, as I because it's just implanted this fear in your yeah, brain. Now? Just, you know, it's there's a reason that you're not called a survivor till after five years. And and there's there's a waiting period now. And that's what I mean. Like when I think of people who are in much more dire straits who live yeah. scan to scan, I don't know how yeah. they do it. I, mm-hmm. It just must be so tough emotionally and mentally because I, I just feel like I. As my friend Lily said, you have the good cancer. And that's true. I had the good cancer, but I it's hard. So I'm actually going to go to a therapeutic yoga for cancer uh, class. Oh. I signed up to do that. That's through the Hospital Cancer Center. And I'm going to do that. I think that's a place for me to start. Um, I started to I went to chair yoga this week. I got cleared for chair yoga. And at the end of uh-huh. class, at the end of class, I just started sobbing. So <laughs> That was good. So, oh, yeah, oh, sobbing. Still a lot of emotions around all of this. Yeah, just a lot. Oh. You know, I was so happy to be back. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just didn't know. And so, and not to be overly dramatic, but you don't know. And yeah. you really don't. And yeah. I've been taking yoga for decades. And they, all those teachers say at the end, oh, it's just such an honor and a privilege to be here practicing. And for years I've been like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, namaste. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, namaste all you day. You know, and like that that's all I could think about was, oh my gosh, it is a privilege to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, right after the surgery, you couldn't imagine going back to yoga. You didn't no. see that, you know. No. You've been real and so no. you you're making all these uh, good small steps, Leon. Yeah. You know? That's what I'm trying to do. Be patient with it. I really have cleared my calendar. I have a little bit of work to do, but not a lot. I haven't done any social things. I I just really from here until Christmas, I just would like to recover and regain my strength and just do the things that are positive and add to my recovery. So Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do that. So and then I've just gotten incredible support from family and friends. So, Mm -hmm. okay, we're going to take a little break now. We're going to come back. We can talk about that. Yeah. You also have we always spend our third segment talking about like media we are enjoying of yeah. all kinds. You have some special selections yes. yeah. that have helped you through right. this time. Yeah. We also have an assignment for everyone who's listening. Yes. You know, like what what we would recommend that you do. Uh, and then we'll just wrap it up. So we're the Satellite Sisters. Stay with us. We're so grateful to have ButcherBox as a sponsor of Satellite Sisters. We're grateful, Liz, because delicious cuts of meat and fish come to our house, to our front door. They're frozen in perfectly proportioned, you know, pieces. And then we can cook them for a delicious dinner. What's not to be grateful for? I know. I know. And the best part is, like, okay, let me use last night as an example. It got to be like 530. I'd been working in the house all day. Hadn't really gotten out. Hadn't done any shopping. I'm like, oh, what am I going to have for dinner? And then I opened my freezer drawer and I had so many excellent butcher box choices. You know, there was a little New York strip there. There were some scallops there. I actually went with the chicken tenders, Liam. I love those chicken tender They're so cuts. delicious. I wouldn't have thought I would ever become a chicken tenders girl. They are so perfect for exactly the kind of night I was having last night. So thank you, ButcherBox, for the convenience. Not just for kids, chicken tenders. They're not, they're just delicious. Yeah, delicious. We are talking about ButcherBox, of course. It's the ultimate convenience. Right to your doorstep, free shipping always, and you can curate those boxes so you get exactly what you want. And of course, it's high quality cuts at an amazing value. And you get these great exclusive member deals. So you never really know what's going to be in my box this month. You get to choose some fun stuff every month. So thank you, ButcherBox, for making our lives more convenient. With ButcherBox, you don't have to worry about what's for dinner. ButcherBox is offering Satellite Sisters listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential. Three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a whole year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash sisters and use code sisters to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Butcherbox.com slash sisters. Use code sisters. Thanks, ButcherBox. Hi, all. Leanne Doland here. 
putting on my novelist hat now because I want to tell you about my new book, The Marriage Sabbatical. It comes out April 2nd and is available for pre-order now. My favorite part about being a novelist is asking myself the question, what if dot, dot, dot. And for this book, The Marriage Sabbatical, I asked myself the question, what if you could take a vacation from your marriage? That's right. In this book, a couple decides to give it a shot. It's fun. It's adventurous. It's what Booklist calls a great choice for book clubs looking for a twist on contemporary fiction tropes. Well, thanks, Booklist. I appreciate that. The Marriage Sabbatical from William Morrow is available for pre-order now everywhere and comes out April 2nd. All right, Liz and Leanne, we're back. This is uh, this is us right now today, March 2024, uh, with this follow-up to colon cancer. It is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and I hope if you take nothing away from this that you will schedule your colonoscopy if you have been dragging your feet, because it absolutely did save my life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something I think about all the time, how I could have, you can hear it in okay. my voice, like in that tape. And now, like if I had waited six more months, I would have had a different prognosis. So, yeah. uh, you know, Leanne, I still can't believe you actually had colon cancer. It just is. Uh, it's such a shocking thing to hear you say every once in a while when we're talking about it and you make a reference to it, I'm like, oh, my God, that's oh, that. Yeah, it, that I was know. a very hard time. It's I such know. a shock. I know. I know. So I'm four and a half years out. Uh, over the last four and a half years, Liz, I've had two clear colonoscopies. I had one a year after my original diagnosis, and then that looked good. So then they recommended one three years uh, later. So I had one again at four, four years after my original diagnosis. Both were clear, um, which is just a huge, giant relief. I can't, yes, I, I mean, yes. and- I would say the overwhelming feeling is I thought about cancer every minute of every day for like the first year. Uh -huh. And then I got that clear colonoscopy and I was so happy. And of course, I wanted to go celebrate and do something. I like felt like I had a mission that first year and I was just going to like keep it clean and do everything the doctor told me. And that that happened in <laughs> I got that colonoscopy, but it was the middle of the pandemic. So I couldn't go anywhere or do anything. And I felt really stupid celebrating because there was a lot of grief and, you know, yes. misery happening in the world. So uh, after that, I was like, I really hit the skids like emotionally. Uh, oh, and really? One, yeah. Yeah. I think for sure, had it not been a pandemic and I could have been out going to a support group. I mean, I was trying to go to yoga. We, I was going to a yoga support group, but that stopped during the pandemic. It was too dangerous to meet and it was too hard to meet online with people who were coming and going. Uh, the teacher didn't want to do that. So I did feel a little unmoored after that first year, like, oh, I could have used more support. And I know that now. Um, what I didn't realize uh, at the time that I would be going to an oncologist every three months. Mm -hmm. I was glad to be in the care of an oncologist, somebody monitoring me. That was, I felt grateful and like some relief, but um, it's also very anxiety uh, provoking all those trips to the oncologist. It's a lot of blood being drawn. You just kind of get in the mindset and it's hard to think of other health problems when you have this sort of overall umbrella of cancer happening. So mm -hmm. that was something that um, I lived with sort of every three or four months. This the soul same is true. Every time I go or have to get a scan or a colonoscopy, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, yeah. And that's still real. And the third thing is there are still diet restrictions. You know, you you can hear it in the first part of the tape that I couldn't I couldn't eat uh, salad, raw vegetables, nuts, seeds, things like that. Um, and I am surprised that some of that stuff has hung around. They're definitely, um, I think it's clear when you listen to the tape, I'll never eat a banana again. And I have not. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Life goes on without bananas. I miss them though. There's a place. <laughs> I do. I do. And I had to like, when, when everybody during the pandemic, pandemic was making banana bread, I'm like, not for me. Can't eat, <laughs> can't eat the bananas anymore. Uh, you know, there's a whole, there's the gold categories. Like I can't eat popcorn anymore. That nearly killed me once. I had a, you know, a terrible 
terrible pains and stuff. I had like one cup of popcorn. That's done for me. Spicy food. I'm just the sad person that goes to the Mexican restaurant and orders the quesadilla now off the kids' menu. Like that's that sad. That's really that is sad. quite a loss in your life. Yes. Especially mm-hmm. living in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I don't eat a lot of fried food. I didn't before, but now I really don't. Surprisingly, Liz, I miss deli turkey more than I can say. Um, like, Why can't you eat deli turkey? You know, even the nitrate-free stuff is not great if you've had cancer. It's just a lot of sodium, concentrated sodium. And so they have done studies that a- anything like a cured meat uh, is not good. Oh, so oh. that takes sausage off the table. It's why ham, even fancy ham, is not great because it's just that concentration of salt in the curing process. Oh, so, so, so long charcuterie? Yeah, I don't really, I have not been able to participate fully in the charcuterie movement of the last four years because I can't really eat any of the salami. And then I have noticed weirdly like super rich food, which is so vague. It's a vague category, but like a brie or like a big bowl of mac and cheese or a big bowl of ice cream, those all make me feel terrible. So I have had to alter my eating um, quite substantially. I feel less stress about eating now than I used to, but I have to say like for three or four years, it's very hard for me to go out to restaurants because I just, I would have to check the menu beforehand to make sure there was something I could eat or yeah. if people invited me places, which fortunately during the pandemic, they didn't. But when, when I had <laughs> to start leaving the, hook. And leaving the house again, just became like, if I, I can't eat raw fish, so like, oh, please don't invite me to sushi. Like, oh, I, I, I would love to go to your birthday lunch, but it's at like a spicy Thai restaurant that's going to kill me. So uh, there's Listen, some- it's all just a reminder that you still have cancer over your head. Right? That is it. I mean, like, it's, it's not-, not so much, oh, can't have sushi. It's, yeah. oh, cancer. That's a really, ooh, got to make sure that doesn't come back. Yeah. And it's also just a remind. it's just a downer of a conversation to have at someone's birthday lunch. Like- Oh, you don't you don't want the raw fish. Well, it's because I have cancer. So it's just a, okay. so there's some practical things that I've just had to deal with and it's been fine. Uh, you know, but it's a couple of the lessons I've learned. One is that it really is a five year waiting. It's a five year journey, regardless of what for the person going through it. Regardless uh-huh. of, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, it might be a longer, more complicated journey for those who are stage three or four. But even when you have, quote, the good cancer, which is what I had, like a stage one operable cancer, it's like breast cancer, it's stage one. I have friends who've had that. They call it the good cancer. We're still going to the oncologist. We're still thinking about it. We're still getting scans. And I do not call myself a survivor because I will be very happy when I get to year five, but I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that's been a surprise to me because I was so focused on that first year and doing everything right. And I think that's why I kind of emotionally hit the skids. It was like, wait, I have four more years of this? Like it all of a sudden seemed really long. Uh, oh, and you know, it is. It is mm-hmm. really long. Five years mm-hmm. is a long time. For sure. <laughs> Especially the last five years. The longest ever, <laughs> I think we've just been through. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, lesson two, I would say for me, I discovered that it's my cancer. It's not anyone else's cancer. Um, my friend, Stephanie, who I mentioned in the episode, she, she also had had colon cancer and she told me this before I went in for surgery. She said, you know, this is kind of a journey you take by yourself. Like you want people to understand and say the right thing and, you know, not say the wrong thing. But the truth is like, they have no idea what you're going through. It's just Mm -hmm. you and you're going through it alone. That's, you know, and she was right about that. I, I get it. People don't want, I don't want to talk about cancer nonstop for five years, even though that's my, that's what I think about a lot of time. So I can't expect other people to do the same thing. And I would say most of my friends and family have been super supportive and great, but there's a limit to that. You can't expect them to understand everything you're going through. It's just impossible for them if they haven't been through it. And it's impossible for you to articulate everything you may be feeling. It's also kind of mm-hmm. tedious. You know, you feel stupid uh, 
bearing, you know, bringing other people down. So I would say that has been a truth that it's my cancer and it's not anyone else's. Mm -hmm. I guess that's Um, why the support groups are important, though, too. It's a different group of people to share things with. That's my next lesson is find your people with support. Um, I, you know, I I didn't right away. And, you know, now I regularly go to a therapeutic yoga for cancer uh, patients. I'm so grateful that this teacher offers it free. We don't have to say anything or talk. It's just for me, it's an hour where I can go and focus on myself, think about de-stressing, be with other people in a room that I don't have to explain a lot of things to. Other people might want to talk support group that's more their jam or something online. But for me, this is just the right amount of support. Like I I get it and I get what they're going through. And some people are going through much harder things than I went through. So it just keeps you thinking about that, but in a positive, healthful way. So I mm-hmm. would say that's a lesson. Find your people, find support. And then the last thing I've learned uh, is that reducing stress is very challenging. And I do think stress has played a huge part in my life and maybe my cancer. Uh, I'm certainly super conscious of the stress of going forward. And I have tried and honestly failed to reduce (laughs) reduce stress. I did not do a good job. (laughs) If I was cancer, I felt kind of like this like everything should get back to normal and this manic energy. And all of a sudden we're oh, like, oh, we're learning all this Zoom stuff and we're producing extra shows. And I had an opportunity to write a couple more books. And like, I just like, oh, you go on by giant book tours. I did not do a good job reducing stress. <laughs> stress. I kept saying. Yeah. So really this try- is about this is about reducing stress, not just related to the cancer, but across your whole life. Because Across every, my whole I'm life. I'm sure all the math. Me- all the medical advice is to get rid of as much stress as you can. Yeah. But yet life goes on and life is stressful. Right. And and it's and it's easy just to get loaded right back up again to the level that you were working at before, uh, for better or worse. Yeah. And I felt like it was, I mean, I, I have done in 2024, I've made some strides in actually reducing that stress, but I was surprised how challenging it was. So, uh, you know, what's not, What's not stress reducing is when people say you should you should reduce your stress, <laughs> and then they <laughs> ask you to do ten things. You're like, okay, well, I'm really trying. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're if you're listening and someone says I'm trying to reduce my stress because of cancer, do not ask them to do something with your next <laughs> breath. I'm, I'm begging you. But um, that is something that I would I would say I did not think that would be a challenge because again, you've had. You know, I you've had a life threatening scare, right? So, oh, make uh-huh. changes. Like, me, it's harder than you think to make changes, Liz. You know, yes. oh, even well, if me, I know yeah. I've learned from that the last three years too, for sure. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So, even though you had this quote wake up call, it, it's still hard and it still takes a real concerted effort. So, you know, that's what I would say after five years, it's really a five year or four and a half years, it's really a five year journey. It's not your cancer. It's your cancer, not anyone else's. You should find your people and get the support you need. And reducing stress can be very challenging. So that's okay. That's kind of the follow up. But uh, mm-hmm. again, want to remind people uh, there are new. We're going to put some resources in the show notes there to the American Cancer Society to reliable sources. Do not just look things up on the internet. I'm begging you. There are some new recommendations for colonoscopy starting at 45. It is unfortunately a growing cancer for people under the age of 50. It used to be kind of a 50 plus cancer, and it's oh, that's not scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it it makes you think a lot about the environment and what's in food and what you're eating yeah. and stress and all, all kinds of things. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so new, new suggestions that you should start your colonoscopies at 45, but we're going to put some resources here if you want more information on that. Um, okay. Wow. Liz, yeah. I know. Sorry. Did I bum you out? Are you bummed out? No, no. Okay. I just really, like, I remember this at the very beginning. It's just, it's, it's sort of a revelation that, here it is. It's still here, front and center in your life, four and a half years later. Yeah, it's really, it's really important to embrace that. Right. I, I guess it is. Yeah. I mean, I think it is. I think um, 
One of the things that I think about all the time is, um, even when I was listening back to this episode, was I made the decision to get my results. I was supposed to call my gastroenterologist and get my results on like Friday. And I thought, oh, I'll just call Monday. And that weekend I went to a really fun wedding and we had a lot of dancing and it was great. And then Monday I got diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> and I think about like, I am so glad I did not call Friday for the results. So if I that's a back salon. Another tip. It would be that. Like, just wait till Monday to get the results. Because I think about like that weekend where I was like, I didn't have cancer that weekend. <laughs> I didn't know it. Yeah, I mean, it's the last, last time in your life where you didn't have cancer. I it guess. was. You crossed yeah. the line. Yeah. And uh -huh. I think, just think about that weekend all the time. So that's another tip. Just call on Monday. It, it can totally wait. It can totally wait till Monday. Totally wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> Good tip, Dr. Leon. <laughs> um, if this is your first time listening to Satellite Sisters, and you know we have tons of episodes up there on the internet, uh, not thousands of them really. But the last in March, we've done some special health related episodes you might be interested in. We had a, a fitness, wellness, aging, uh, healthfully episode a couple weeks ago. We also did an episode on menopause, and this is our follow up to colon cancer. So you can check out the last three episodes at SatelliteSisters.com or whatever podcast platform you listen to. Okay. Uh, Liz, do you have anything else? Do you have a to-do? Uh, so my to-do list, I was thinking about this. I do have, like next week, I actually have my annual physical. So trying to stay on top of that. But let's just say it hasn't been quite as annual as it used to be mm -hmm. lately. Yeah. So getting back on board with that. And I've already made my uh, uh, mammogram appointment. So I know I'm I know I'm all caught up on my colonoscopies. I'm pretty on time with my mammography. I love the whole electronic medical records thing now where you can look up everything. You can really see when was the last time you did this test or had that communication with your doctor. So anyway, I have a lot of March. I'm getting a lot of good medical care dur during the month. During the month of March, Leon, I'm inspired. You know, I do. I would say this, like when you have a major one major health issue, it's really easy to let a lot of other things slide because you mm -hmm. just there's just not space in your head to deal with other stuff. And yeah. I absolutely let a lot of things slide until um, I got that clear colonoscopy last summer. So I, too, am on a I'm on a quest to do all the things I haven't done, including mammography, eye exam. I got a lot of dental. Uh, I have, you know, a call caught up on my dentist and things like that. So, yeah, my to do yeah. is just to to sort of embrace all the other pieces of me that are falling apart now. <laughs> Which is routine falling apart. Yeah. I just want to get back to that. Instead of things actually breaking, I just want, I can deal with routine aging, I think. I think. If I just don't get any more surprises. All right. Uh, that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, thanks for taking care of yourself. Thanks for sharing this with the satellite sister or satellite mister who needs a nudge to get their colonoscopy. Please, please, please tell your friends. Uh, we're the Satellite Sisters. Liz, have a great week. You too, Liam. Don't forget, call your Satellite Sister. <laughs>